and the fan grabs him and he just goes, Chicago, Chicago, Chicago. And it was like, wow. Like, I, it looked like Punk was never going to get out of this man's grasp, but it was awesome. CM Punk was back in WWE. What's up, world? It's your boy Tommy on the spot for Watch Along Wrestling. Hopefully everyone is doing well and staying safe. Thanks so much for checking out the video here today. Very excited to get into this one. This is part three of our series looking at the Survivor Series. And so if this is your first time visiting the channel and maybe you saw CM Punk over in that thumbnail, so you decided to click this video, thanks so much for doing so. I will go ahead and put a link into the descriptions below, but I've actually been breaking down the Survivor Series main events from worst to best by decade all week long here on the channel. So the first video I had was breaking down the Survivor Series back in the 1980s and 90s, perhaps when Mean Gene Okerlund was asking us, who will survive? Then we went through the Survivor Series in the 2000s, looking at really a battle of brand supremacy most years between Raw and SmackDown. And now here we are today, 14 main events to rank from worst to best in the years 2000, in the 2010s through the 2020s. So from 2010, all the way up until present day, just last year with War Games. And so I'm very excited to dive into all of this. Now, of course, again, if this is your first time visiting the channel, the way I usually rank these is obviously personal preference, first and foremost. This is the Watch Long Wrestling YouTube channel, and I am Tommy on the spot. So these are my rankings. If I get them wrong, if you disagree, let me know in the comment section below. I would love to read your rankings of all of these matches. I also rank the matches from the start of the main event all the way through the end. So I've been watching these back to back, which is a lot of fun because you get to kind of see the changeover in WWE each year. Um, and I typically will watch the beginning of the show and then I'll watch the that opening video package to start the show. Then I'll watch the video package leading up to the main event, the main event proper all the way through the end of the show. And so everything that's included in this is going to be uh, in this rankings is not just the main event, but also what comes after the main event, which in this particular list, boy, there's a lot that comes after some of these main events. So uh, all of that is going to be inclusive. And for me, I always like to try to look at some of the historical significance behind some of these matches as well as uh, what storyline development was going on. So we'll kind of go through some of that bits and pieces. Of course, on the Watch the Wrestling YouTube channel, a major part of what we do here is the live event experience. And I was lucky enough to be at two of these Survivor Series events. So typically there's a little bit of a live bias not the case this time. We'll get into some of those. They're not very high on the list. These were not Survivor Series events that I'd say were breaking the walls down, so to speak, in terms of the greatest Survivor Series ever, but always fun memories along the way. So with that being said, let's jump right into this here. Number 14, kicking off our final part of our Survivor Series rankings as we rank each main event from worst to best is Survivor Series 2013, The Big Show versus Randy Orton, and this was one of the Survivor Series that I was at live. Um, my wife, uh, at the time my girlfriend, now my wife, uh, took me to this show, surprised me actually. As a matter of fact, I had gone with my wife to go see uh, SummerSlam 2013. We had such a great time, and that was, I mean, the place was on fire. People were just so excited for every single thing. The WWE was, I think, really hot at the time. You had Brock versus Punk. Daniel Bryan versus John Cena. Such a great show. So much fun. One day I'll have to really go through that in long form here on the channel. Um, and this, I think at this point now, my wife's really starting to catch the bug. As have most of her friends because the WWE had launched Total Divas. That show was really picking up a lot of steam in terms of like kind of that Kardashian type of audience. And so all of them were really into it. And I remember at the time I had a tentative plan to go to Survivor Series with my buddies. But my wife surprised me and got me four seats to this Survivor Series, which was awesome. And it was uh, totally something that I had never experienced. It was by far the closest I'd ever sat at a WWE show or certainly at a WWE premium live event, pay-per-view, what have you. Um, and I think that really helped the, the show itself. But I do remember her being so amped up, so excited to be there. Really her second live event and me being really nervous because I knew that the crowd was going to turn on this match. Something fierce here, the main event between Big Show and Randy Orton. The whole show here is kind of weird. The traditional Survivor Series matches fun but the rest of the show is bizarre one day i'll have to kind of go through this in long form as well because we do have a lot of really fun stories to get into about this show but not much of it involves this main event basically what had happened here was wwe finally caved and gave daniel bryan an opportunity within this yes movement character to become world heavyweight champion at SummerSlam. obviously they took the title off him immediately randy orton comes in cashes in wins the title and orton and bryan kind of feuded over the next couple months but it was clear that 
come this event here at Survivor Series, they're going to be kind of moved on past the idea of Daniel Bryan being world champion. Uh, they had him kind of work in the mid-card there with Punk against the Wyatt family. And even though these guys were still toward the top of the card, I don't think WWE had any plans to make Daniel Bryan world champion again. And so what they decided to do, though, was because the yes movement was so over, you know, the yes, 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 yes. You couldn't go anywhere in 2013 without people doing the yes. That's how over the yes movement was. And WWE knew this, but just didn't want to be pushing Daniel Bryan, so they decided to take Daniel Bryan's Yes movement and try to move it over to The Big Show. The Big Show, who honestly is another guy that WWE has never gone all the way with. I think they've always kind of felt there was something missing with The Big Show. I mean, granted, he's main evented WrestleMania as multiple times world champion, but he never felt like he was that tippy-top guy. And so for a very brief period here, they try to push that The Big Show is the new kind of Daniel Bryan. He's doing the Yes chant. He's feuding with the authority, and it just does not work. I mean, it's weird because he's not really been feuding too much with Orton going into this match. He's feuding directly with Hunter. And I remember it looked like the plan, at least at this point, for WrestleMania was going to be Big Show versus Hunter. There's even an elite figure with Big Show, and his, like, accessory is a big Triple H sign because he was feuding with the authority so much. And uh, he gets this match here. Crowd is, is, is half dead for it, half cheering for Tom Brady because the Patriots were mounting a big comeback, and half just booing the Big Show. And so... I remember my wife being like, why, why is everyone hating on the Big Show? What, what's going on here? And me trying my best to still act like, no! Like, Rome is burning around me, but I'm still acting like, no, no, nothing's going wrong. Everyone loves this match. And so, years later, I can tell you, this match isn't very good. And that's why it's number 14 here on our countdown. I'm moving right along here, number 13, Survivor Series 2017. Oh, what could have been is the main event team raw versus team smackdown and if you look at these matches if you look at everyone who was on each one of these teams there is no reason that this should not have been a great match let's take a look at team smackdown team smackdown you had your established main eventers your legends if you will john cena randy orton shane mcmahon and you also had kind of the new breed the new crop coming over from nxt two successful runs glorious bobby Roode and shinsuke nakamura going up against team raw similarly constructed you had your two legends, Kurt Angle and Triple H, and then you kind of had your guys who were going to be the future of WWE, Samoa Joe, Finn Balor, and Braun Strowman. And so going into this match, it was really interesting. It felt like this was going to be like a passing of the torch match, and it was coming off the heels of a very fun show. You had The Shield against The New Day. You had Brock Lesnar versus AJ Styles. They'd really kind of reinvigorated the entire brand supremacy type of deal. They uh, I thought they did the brand split better than they ever had in 2016, and that lasted a solid two years. You remember SmackDown was really, you know, the, show, the land of opportunity, so to speak. You had Shane McMahon and Daniel Bryan leading the charge, and Raw had Stephanie McMahon and Mick Foley, and then later Kurt Angle leading the charge. It felt like two completely different shows and two completely ways of booking the show. SmackDown had the incredible talking smack after the show, which felt like kind of off the cuff, uh, you know, real life almost in some of the interviews they did. Really fun era to be a fan. And so going into this main event, I was amped up, I was excited. And the main event here is a disaster. Very quickly, Finn Balor, Samoa Joe, Shinsuke Nakamura, Glorious Bobby Roode, they're dismissed. They're like gone, you don't even think about them. Like all of these new fun names coming from NXT, they're completely eliminated and they're like non-factors in this match almost entirely. Uh, not so soon after that, it comes down to the final four men in the match, and it comes down to, on the Raw side, Triple H, Kurt Angle, and Braun Strowman going up against representing Team SmackDown. You're thinking what I'm thinking, yep, LOL, Cena wins. No, it wasn't John Cena. Maybe it'd be Randy Orton, that sole survivor for the years in his Survivor Series history. No, it wasn't Randy Orton. It was Shane McMahon. And don't get me wrong, I love Shane McMahon. He is one of my favorites, if not my favorite of all time. I think the world of him. I'm a Shane McMahon apologist. Nothing annoyed me more than when people complained about Shane McMahon being put in the match with AJ Styles at WrestleMania 33. But there is no reason why Shane McMahon should have been going three-on-one to end the night at the end of this Survivor Series show. I just, it's ridiculous. And even though there's some fun there with him and Hunter going at it, because you kind of always knew it was unspoken bond, like deal that... Maybe Shane McMahon and Hunter didn't get along as well as you would have thought. You remember he was on some sort of podcast hosted by Mick Foley on the WWE Network. And when Mick asked him, hey, what are your thoughts on Triple H? Shane said, I mean, he makes my sister happy. <laughs> Which I think is all you needed to know about his thoughts on Triple H. So seeing them go out, it was fun. 
But it isn't even like, there's not even many hope spots. Triple H uh, turns on Kurt Angle, pedigrees him, throws Shane on top of Kurt Angle, one, two, three, Shane's eliminated, and then Hunter just pedigrees Shane, and Triple H, the future is bright. Triple H looks strong to end Survivor Series 2017. Now granted, Braun Strowman was with Hunter, and he at this point is still white hot. They had a solid two year stretch here, where at any moment they could have given Braun Strowman the title and just saw what they had here. And they never fully pulled the trigger on it, but it's clear at the end of this show that the plans for WrestleMania looked like they were gonna be Triple H versus Braun Strowman. Strowman lays out Hunter to a big crowd pop to end the show. But uh, obviously that changed because WWE got Ronda Rousey, and so they went with Ronda and Kurt Angle. I guess initially Batista was slotted for that spot against uh, Hunter and Steph, and it was great. So you can't really fault that, but what could have been with Braun Strowman, uh, that's probably the lone highlight of this pretty train wrecky type of main event here in 2017. Moving right along here, number 12. I thought for sure this was gonna be number 14 for me uh, going into it, but I went back, I watched this, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Survivor Series 2010, Wade Barrett versus Randy Orton with special guest referee John Cena. And the, the storyline going into this one is John Cena, if he is to get him, say, if Wade Barrett does not win the title, John Cena would be fired from WWE. And so that is the dilemma that Cena's faced with. He loves being a part of WWE. This is all he's ever worked for. At the same time, is he kind of doing the wrong thing here? Will he be willing to do the wrong thing and help Wade Barrett get the world title at the expense of one of his greatest rivals ever in Randy Orton so that he can keep his job? And so it was kind of an interesting hook. And I remember the time I didn't get this show. Uh, matter of fact, this might be the very first time I went back and watched this particular match. Uh, it was one of these deals where, you know, remember still 2010 is still pre-network, so all the pay-per-views were $50, $60. And I remember a lot of my friends that I would order pay-per-views with being very turned off after the Nexus was beat at SummerSlam 2010. It felt like their interest in WWE really kind of got reinvigorated with uh, the Nexus. A bunch of them had the Nexus shirts, you're, you're with us or your Nexus or whatever that uh, deal was. They were really excited about being there and being kind of back involved with WWE. But when they lost, I think they really were kind of out of it. So I wasn't about to drop $50, $60 on this show on my own. So I didn't really see this until many years later. This very well might have been the very first time. Uh, but give them credit. They, they actually built this really well. And uh, shout out to uh, my, my buddy Alex Dorio from the Talking Taker podcast had recommended me going back and watching the Roddy Piper John Cena interview. They did a deal on, I believe it was like an old school Raw going into this Survivor Series where Piper kind of really has a heart to heart with John Cena and says like, hey, if you don't do the right thing here, and if you don't call this down the middle, you're gonna be spitting on the graves of all the legends before you. And I thought it was just so well done, so great. Cena ends up uh, doing the right thing. He calls it down the middle. Randy Orton wins, and so Cena loses. And so now Cena's fired, and it's funny because at the end of this match, uh, Matt Stryker's doing commentary, and I will say I love Matt Stryker, local guy. He taught at my high school. I used to watch him in the indies and some of the first ever indie shows I went to, paid his dues, um, and he's a good guy. But uh, he had a rough go at it as though to be commentator. And here at the end of this match, Cena wins and he goes, Cena's freed! And you just hear like utter disgust from Michael Cole as he's like, Cena's fired. And he goes, oh, right, sorry, my bad. It's just, uh, it's bizarre and it's weird, uh, but you could tell like it was starting to brew and then I think eventually come Royal Rumble 2011 when he does the mark out moment for Booker T, that's the end of Matt Stryker. But you know, the thing that's most frustrating about this match for me was they had this really nice send off at the end where Cena kind of looks back and leaves his uh, armbands there and it looked like, all right, well, how are they going to do this here? Like, are they really going to have programming without Cena? It's kind of exciting because he had been at the top of the card for so long. But he was brought back just several weeks later. He's there in time for uh, the build to WrestleMania 27. He main events that show. And so it kind of just is what it is. And unfortunately, I feel like the casket started to uh, be built for the Nexus going uh, at SummerSlam 2010, uh, 2010 right? Uh, and here, I think, is the final nail in that coffin. When, Orton, when uh, Barrett still doesn't get the win, doesn't get the title here. I just don't think there was ever recovery from that. And after this, he goes off. He makes the core group, and while he is rumored heavily to have the Undertaker match at WrestleMania 27, and said he's beat in seconds. Number 11, Survivor Series 2019, Becky Lynch versus Bayley versus Shayna Baszler. And so now they took the brand supremacy deal and they added NXT to the mix. This was at the time, I remember, very exciting because if you had watched NXT for a while, NXT was having some of the most incredible pay-per-views 
just in awesome shows. Every one of those takeovers, you know, you'd have five to six matches and it would just be like balls to the wall, given 110% every single time. You, you never went wrong with an NXT takeover. So to see them being incorporated into the main storyline here and being such a big part of Survivor Series was a lot of fun. And it was for sure the time where WWE was the most heavily invested in NXT. Reason being, NXT was going head to head with a new group by the name of AEW. AEW Dynamite had debuted uh, just that same year. And so WWE was doing everything they could to get as many eyeballs on NXT. And I mean, really just a fun roster of NXT at that time. You have Adam Cole in 2019, Johnny Gargano, Keith Lee. It was like, they really felt like you had the new crop of stars for WWE in NXT. And probably at the top of that list, for me at least, was Shayna Baszler, who was having really solid women's matches, really being presented as a legitimate badass and a legitimate uh, presentation entirely around Shayna uh, throughout. I remember she had won the NXT Women's Championship, first person to do it two times, which was awesome. And I was very excited to see her here in this main event, going against two of the real faces of the four horsewomen of the new era of WWE Women's Wrestling in Becky Lynch and Bayley. For some reason though, this match was weird. And I almost feel, and I don't know if it's, it might very well be because of where these uh, people are today. I mean, today, you know, Becky Lynch and Bayley are held as two of the biggest stars in WWE even today, even though Becky's, you know, either taking a hiatus or maybe done altogether. They're still two of the biggest stars in WWE, Whereas Shayna, I feel like, has just never really been given the same chance that she did when she was in NXT. And it's a shame because I think she could have done a lot more, but her presentation on the main roster has gone from bad to just weird. Remember, she debuted as the vampire, biting up people's neck. <laughs> it's just bizarre. And I think maybe that's why I have kind of a negative tinge on this particular match. But I also do think, looking back at it, WWE kind of sacrificed their main roster here for NXT in a bit, if you think about it. AJ Styles and Shinsuke Nakamura lose on this show to Roderick Strong. And hey, I love Roderick Strong. I think he's great. But in the landscape of WWE, he was never going to be any at the level of Shinsuke. Certainly not at the level of AJ Styles. So to have him, you know, beat both of them clean is, is kind of strange and a little bit weird. Uh, so at the end of the day here, Shayna does win the match. She stands tall. I remember being really pumped up when it ended. But watching it back, the match itself does lack a little bit of uh, excitement. I don't know exactly what it was. Uh, wasn't great. What's, honestly, it wasn't a great match, and that's why it's over here at number 11. Moving right along here, 2020 Survivor Series. Now, I will say this. I know I said I usually include everything at the end of the show. I did not do that for this main event. It's a weird main event. I didn't know how to do this Survivor Series. I was like, do we utilize the Undertakers going away as the main event? Because remember, Undertaker retires at the end of this show and has like a 45-minute presentation uh, kind of dedication to him. Uh, which is very nice. I do think they probably could have waited till fans came back. I know it was the 30th anniversary of Survivor Series 1990 and his debut, and I get all of that, but I think in retrospect, it would have been really cool to have fans have that opportunity to be there for that. Of course, fans ended up getting to be there for the Hall of Fame, so maybe it's, you know, whatever. But at the same time, I didn't include this in looking at the main events. Instead, I looked at Roman Reigns versus Drew McIntyre from Survivor Series 2020. You know, I never thought I'd go back and watch anything from the pandemic era, but this project has led me to do just that. And it is uh, still very strange to go back and watch these matches. The presentation with the Thunderdome is weird. It's distracting. You've got all these random faces all over the place that are like not super invested in the match or they look like maybe they do and they don't know where to look on the camera. It's just weird. And then you also have the piped in noise, which makes it sound like almost like a static going around. It's just weird and not not particularly great if I'm being honest uh, but other than the presentation this is an awesome match uh, you know Drew McIntyre and Roman absolutely tear it up I I was surprised how much I enjoyed this and you'd almost forget because Roman is so part-time and has been now for the last couple of years you forget during that pandemic era when Roman returns to SummerSlam 2020 and then those two years that follow he was on every show he was building up this tribal chief thing so much so and I mean, also, during the pandemic era, his matches are actually a lot of fun because it allows for him to go and, you know, go through all of the, uh, the little bits and pieces and the nuances of this character. You got to hear him talk during matches. You really got to see his deep selling and the facial expressions and everything that came along with becoming the Tribal Chief. Um, at the same time, I think I forgot how much I enjoyed Drew McIntyre as World Champion as well. I think he was honestly... Um, underrated in the role and it's a shame that he never got a chance to be that top babyface 
with fans as well because I think people were really starting to take to him before the pandemic. Obviously, things happened. Um, and so it was cool to kind of see him in this spot here. Um, good, they had really good in ring chemistry. And then it's a fun little tidbit at the end J Jay Uso comes out to help Roman win the match. And when he does, uh, they start talking about how Jay Uso is still trying to prove himself to Roman Reigns, which is an interesting tidbit when you consider what would come with the bloodline a little bit later on. So, uh, in any event, I really enjoyed this match. If you get, if you can get past the pandemic era and kind of the presentation of the Thunderdome, it's definitely worth a rewatch. It's a fun match. Moving right along here, number nine here on the countdown. We're going back to Survivor Series 2015. Got a couple Roman Reigns matches coming up here back to back. It is Roman Reigns versus Dean Ambrose in the main event, the finals of the uh, world title tournament. I'll be very honest, I was very, I flip-flopped on nine and eight. I think nine and eight, you'll see what I have ranked at number eight. Flipped up on eight, I think you could have that match at nine. Um, at the time, I remember thinking, this is gonna be Ambrose cr crowning a chief. I think the hope was, you had kind of been there and done that with Roman Reigns. The crowd was rejecting him. They were not willing to accept this guy as the baby, big baby face they wanted him to. And on the opposite side of things, you had a guy in Dean Ambrose that people had been been really behind for quite some time. I mean, I think even at the end of 2014, I remember going to a Raw from the Barclays Center, and it really felt like, oh, Dean Ambrose is being positioned as the next big guy in WWE, that maybe that next baby face that maybe he's a little bit rough around the edges, but he can be somebody to really build around. Um, but they did make you wait another year for that, as uh, they did give Roman the title here. And uh, I mean, honestly, really strong match here. And then it's interesting because obviously Roman wins, and you can almost feel the groan from the crowd, right? And they did not give up on Roman Reigns. When I thought about that, Roman was top baby face and main event in the next two WrestleManias. They didn't care at all. They were happy to have next three WrestleManias. My God, he got main event four WrestleManias in a row as Big Dog Roman Reigns who was booed heavily and rejected at his first WrestleMania main event in 2015. They were stubborn. In any event, one of the cool pieces of this match though, interesting piece, is they have the confetti pouring down on Roman, like over the top confetti. Like you would have thought this was a beloved baby face. It's, it harkens back to Shawn Michaels winning the title at Survivor Series 2002, uh, where you believed that story, you watched the character for so many years and he finally comes back and he gets that one last title reign, and everyone's kind of soaking in the adulation there. Um, that's what they tried to recreate here with Roman, and uh, it just is weird, man. It just doesn't work at all. And uh, eventually Triple H should come out, and Roman's you know, now covered in confetti. There's so much confetti all over the place. And Hunter kind of teases coming to the ring, then he kind of harkens back, and who should turn around behind him? Bang! Bro kick, Sheamus, one, two, three, world champion they took it off roman and at the time i remember thinking like it was one of these deals where it was like oh roman won anyone but him and then you saw sheamus broke kick and it was like wait 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 we didn't mean anyone but him because sheamus while he's having banger after banger now and i love the guy uh back in 2015 was part of the league of nations uh one of the worst factions really of all time it was sheamus wade barrett rusev and uh, alberto del rio and, Shane, and they felt like a total mid-card, going-nowhere type of faction. And out of nowhere, Sheamus cashes in Money in the Bank. I remember when he won Money in the Bank, I was like, what are they doing? And here he is, he cashes in, he wins the title uh, for the first time in several years. And not only does he win the title, but you start to realize what WWE is doing, and they actually it actually works. They end up giving the title to Sheamus, who at the time is like the most hated guy on the roster. And so what they ended up doing was getting Roman Reigns over. Uh, I remember they had a match uh, in Philadelphia, which obviously is a city that used to boo Roman heavily, and they got so behind Roman. They went nuts for him. Uh, and Roman would win the title back here in less than a month and uh, would continue to kind of be in and out of the main event scene until eventually becoming the Tribal Chief. But this here match uh, with, with Ambrose is, is very good. Go back and check it out. And then I think the stuff with Sheamus at the end is a lot of fun as well. Uh, moving right along here, number eight, Survivor Series 2021, a show I was at, a very weird show. Remember, <laughs> this show is all about The Rock's movie that had debuted on Netflix that weekend. And so uh, in that movie, they have like this um, uh, stone. And so WWE really sacrifices this show to promote Rock's movie. And the entire opening video package to this show is a commercial for The Rock's Netflix movie. It is bizarre and you expect throughout this entire match and i remember sitting there and thinking throughout this whole show well if they're doing all this rock's gotta be showing up right and we're coming off the heels of money in the bank 2021 roman reigns getting on the mic 
Acknowledge Me, out comes John Cena. SummerSlam 2021, he beats John Cena, gets on the mic, Acknowledge Me, here comes Brock Lesnar. So I remember at this particular show, him and Biggie in this ring, and him, I'm thinking, oh boy, he's getting on the ring, he's getting on the mic, and out comes The Rock, and that's going to set your stage for uh, for things to come. Most likely at that year's WrestleMania, you, you figured Dallas, Texas Stadium, it made sense for that to be the host of the finally this match between Roman Reigns and The Rock, which we're still waiting on, uh, but it was not to be. Instead, Roman won this match pretty unceremoniously. He did win it clean, but Roman didn't win too many matches clean, so that was interesting. Um, and kind of just that's the end of the that's the end of the match. That being said, the match is very good, and I think one of the things WWE coming out of the pandemic and getting set in that 2021 was really kind of a year for them where it's clear they're trying to figure out what's sticking and what's not sticking. Right? They have a clearly they don't really know what the live crowds are going to react to, what the live crowds are going to enjoy, because all they're going off of of really what. The response was from the internet audience because there were no live fans in attendance which is a very different audience that internet audience which obviously you and i are a part of we're very different than the live event audience which is mostly families mostly kids you know the parents are out there the ones that are spending all that money for their kids at the merchandise stand so not having that i think wwe was still trying to pick and choose what was going to work what wasn't going to work but i think something that was on the verge of really working was the biggie world title run and i think biggie could have been a top main eventer for WWE for a really long time. I think he was starting to, you know, branch out to the mainstream as champion. He was starting to get a lot of eyeballs on WWE that had not always been there. I remember going into this show, he's like uh, leading down a boxer. Some boxer had retired, I forget his name at the time, and Big E led him down to the ring. Felt like Big E was, was something really fresh in the main event scene. And unfortunately, you know, day one, Roman Reigns gets COVID. They end up doing a deal where uh, they have Brock Lesnar go into the, the main event with Big E and win that title right away. And in doing so, uh, Big E never got back to that spot. I mean, he's pretty ball. Unfortunately, got hurt just a couple months after this. But even so, at that WrestleMania after this, he's just thrown into like a random mid cardy six-man match with the New Day. I feel like they had a lot more with uh, Big E, and that definitely is seen here when I went back and watched this match. I think he came across really well. I remember really wanting him to win and feeling like, hey, Roman could still keep the title. It wouldn't kill him to take one loss to Big E. And I understand at the time, I didn't know we'd be going on this almost another three years with Roman never getting that loss. So that when he eventually does to the Usos and eventually does to Cody, it means so much. But I still think it would have meant a lot and it would have gotten a lot if Big E had gotten the win here. So that is what it is. But honestly, really good match here. Moving right along here, number seven, Survivor Series 2018, Brock Lesnar versus Daniel Bryan. Something I never thought I'd say. For the longest time, this was the match that eluded us. This was the dream match you never thought you'd see because obviously Daniel Bryan had gotten injured in 2014 and then he had came back and then he got injured again and eventually had to retire from WWE in 2016. But even him on Total Bellas and in every interview post uh, his injury was always talking about hopefully getting this match here with Brock Lesnar, um, talking about how he'd be able to do it. He'd be able to do it without getting hurt. And uh, they finally have this match here in 2018. Daniel Bryan is reinstated in the beginning of 2018. And ironically enough, going into this match, it was supposed to be the rematch of the year prior. AJ Styles versus Brock Lesnar, the two of them having the titles going into Survivor Series 20, uh, 2017 and then still having those titles here going into uh, Survivor Series 2018 after we were unfortunately... Uh, we had the match taken away with uh, taken away from us that was supposed to be Brock Lesnar versus Jinder Mahal, which I thought would have just been so interesting to see how they booked that. But instead they went with uh, AJ versus Brock, which I'm sure in the ring was a lot better. Um, but going into this show, they did the switcheroo again. Daniel Bryan cheats to beat AJ Styles, turns heel in the process, and now he was set up to face Brock Lesnar. And I remember just being like, let's go. This is going to be awesome. And don't be fooled by this match being ranked number seven. I think, honestly, everything above it is just so historically significant and has so much uh, there. But this is a really fun one. And honestly, uh, you know, it was a match I, I never thought I'd be able to see. I always thought Brock Lesnar, when he's in there with your technical wrestlers, your guys who are smaller than him, is when he really shines and when he's at his absolute best. So I loved seeing that. And for me, I was just really stoked to be able to see the match i remember daniel bryan now again remember he just turned heels so that's kind of a weird deal because they're both heels in this match but lesnar is always kind of a tweener but daniel bryan had just turned heel and even though he comes out and he's doing his kind of crawl walk to get to the ring he, he kind of becomes the de facto babyface of the match and wrestles the match like a total babyface 
uh, against Lesnar, which I think honestly works for the dichotomy between Lesnar and, and Brian, for Brian to be the babyface. So they have a really good match. Lesnar does get the win here, which I think was fine at the time. And after this, there'd be no more babyface. I know Brian would be getting into the Planet Champion, probably one of the most, uh, one of my favorite runs of his entire career. Survivor Series, next up, number six, Survivor Series 2016. Never thought I'd have a Bill Goldberg match ranked so high, but yet here we are. Brock Lesnar versus Bill Goldberg. And you know me, I've always been a bit of a Bill Goldberg hater, but I absolutely loved his run in 2016. And I was stunned that I loved his run in 2016. I remember hearing Goldberg was coming back and I was like, why? We saw him in WWE in 2003 and 2004 and it was bad. It was just the matches weren't great. His presentation wasn't great. He clearly was getting annoyed at fans who were turning on him. Fans didn't really take to him. So why are we bringing him back here in 2016? But I guess when the video game came out and they announced Goldberg was a part of it, there was a lot of buzz. And eventually this does lead to a return here for Goldberg. And it was such a cool return. It really was. I remember he comes back on Raw and everybody in the crowd is doing the Goldberg chant. You have the mayor of the city there doing the Goldberg chant. He cuts, honestly, what I consider to be the best promo of his career. He makes this impassioned speech about how he's doing this for his family, he's doing this for his kid. And not only is he doing it for his kid, but he's doing it for every other kid out there that views him as this, you know, larger than life superhero. And that's what means the world to him. And at that point, I think I realized, you know, yes, I'm team Bret Hart. Yes, I'm team... Triple H from Tough Enough in 2001, but maybe Goldberg as a dude is not that bad of a guy. And I think that's, you know, really kind of dawned on me there. And then you get kind of hyped. You're thinking, all right, how are they going to do this here? Because Lesnar still had not lost a match clean since his match at beating the streak in 2014. And it was very clear that when he would eventually get beaten, it would be in order to get somebody over, right? Whether that be, you know, and eventually that's exactly what happened. He got Roman over, Rollins over, McIntyre over. But it felt like the guy who was going to definitively beat him first has got to be a guy who's going to be for the future. So you knew Goldberg wasn't going to do it. But at the same time, it's like, why are they bringing Goldberg back to lose? Well, we, I was completely off in my analysis. Match starts. It lasts less than two minutes. That's why it's kind of odd to have this rank so high. But I think it's the greatest squash match in the history of WWE. Spear, 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 jackhammer, one, two, three. It's exactly how Goldberg should have been booked the first time around. But I don't think you had guys who were in the position Lesnar was in 2016, where he had been protected so much that that loss was like, holy crap, are you kidding me? Uh, I, I'll even sometimes just go throw this one on because it is so funny and it's so great to kind of go back and watch. And I think if they had stuck with this and then they had Goldberg right off into the sunset, come back for the rematch against Lesnar at WrestleMania 33 and then retire, that would have been perfect. Instead, they had him come back, beat Kevin Owens, ending a great title reign, get the title unnecessarily, and then have that great match with Lesnar at 33. That's the one misstep. I don't think he needed the title, and I definitely don't think he needed the seven years that had followed 2017. But this run, fun. Moving right along here, we're getting to our top five. We're going to start with 2012 triple threat match. John Cena versus Ryback versus the World Heavyweight Champion CM Punk. And so now going here, CM Punk is officially a heel, which for me, I think... Is it not my favorite thing in the world? Certainly was not when it first happened. In retrospect, I think CM Punk was a great heel. But if you go back to 2011, I think a lot of people actually define that era of wrestling, the reality era, so to speak. And I think it starts with CM Punk and the pipe bomb promo that he cuts leading up to Money in the Bank 2011. So to now take that guy who was such a fun alternative babyface that we had been yearning for for so long to have somebody else who was a top babyface other than Cena and have it be someone who's really nothing like Cena in Punk, I thought was a really fun deal here. And instead, uh, now you're turning him heel. I understand kind of where they were coming from with it. I think that Punk was so popular that I think they were worried people were going to turn against Rock and Cena, which was obviously their big money match going into Mania 20 eight here in 2012 and then again at 29 they wanted to bring it back which i still don't understand and i guess punk turning heel allowed for him to be the one to face rock first and really be involved in that whole rock cena dynamic going into 2013 but the only good piece about this is that at least he still has the world title and i thought you know him being the champion and tell people you know your your arms are too short to box with god during his promo with the rock and be battling off against cena was a lot of fun, and I thought that he, he did handle himself well. Also, at the same time, you have a really fun baby face in Ryback. I don't care what anybody says. Maybe Ryback wasn't your cup of tea. Feed Me More wasn't your deal. 
But when he first showed up and he was going through his undefeated streak, I thought Ryback was great. And I thought they could have really gone all the way with Ryback. And so to now have a new, another fun baby face in the mix, I thought was really cool. And remember, this is coming off the heels of uh, Hell in a Cell 2012, where Punk uh, has the troubleshooting referee there and Brad Maddox help him to keep the belt. So now he's become this smarmy guy who has people trying to help him, which of course leads us to 2012. And while the match itself is good, the thing that it's always going to be remembered for is the debut of The Shield, Dean Ambrose, Seth Rollins, Roman Reigns, probably the most successful faction in all of WWE history when you look at the fact that every member of this faction, all three members, went on to be the, the world champion uh, and have gone on to be world champion for many years to come, if you can include John Moxley's run in AEW. And the three of these guys have been the top of the cards. And I remember when they first debuted, a lot of people were like, oh, who's the Roman Reigns? I knew exactly who Roman Reigns was. I was pumped for uh, Joe Anawaii coming into WWE when I had heard he was wrestling when he was there in Georgia Tech and when he's in the crowd there uh, doing one of the old, older Hall of Fames before he even gets signed to WWE. So I knew about Roman Reigns. And so I, I didn't know his name was Roman Reigns, but I knew who he was right when he showed up. And I was like pumped up. And obviously I knew Rollins from Ring of Honor as Tyler Black. I knew a little bit of Moxley from his time on the Indies, but certainly was much more familiar with, with Rollins' time as Tyler Black and Ring of Honor went to those shows all the time. So I was so excited to see these three guys. And never in a million years did I think they were going to be pushing Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose, guys who were like household indie names, toward the top of the card in WWE. But the presentation was fantastic. And Punk found a way to slither his way to another win. Uh, I think this is fun. And they keep getting to the point where, hey, Punk's coming up on a year. Is he going to lose the belt? Makes you start thinking like, ah, oh, they're going to take the belt away. At the end, he gets the last laugh and keeps the historic reign going. So... This is a fun one and a big part of that is CM Punk long title reign in 2012. I did lie. Uh, number four, I was at this show as well. I don't know how I said I was only at two. I was at three different Survivor Series and this one very well might be a live bias. It is the main event of Summer Survivor Series 2011. First time ever, last time ever, John Cena teaming with The Rock to take on Awesome Truth, the team of The Miz and R-Truth. I was at this show. I loved this entire era of WWE. One of my favorite years of... WWE was at Rumble that year, was at Mania that year, and I was at Survivor Series that year. So I had three of the big four, and it's one that I was very excited about, and uh, one that, looking back, to this, I think it holds up really well. I think that Rock having his big first ever return match, which at the time was surprising, because he figured, no way are they going to have Rock get in the ring before Russ, uh, WrestleMania 28, but yet here he is in the ring, teaming with Cena, <clears throat> and having that interesting dynamic between the two of them, Going up against Awesome Truth, which feels strange, but Awesome Truth was booked really strong going into Survivor Series. That year, they were really built up as like a legitimate threat um, and top heels there, but there was no no question about who was going to win this one. It was, of course, uh, The Rock and John Cena, but seeing Rock in Madison Square Garden make his big in-ring return in the building where he made his WWE debut some 25 years later, I guess 15 years later, um, at... Survivor Series 1996, it was great, and I loved it, and I remember at the time, one of the cool things was, the crowd was so into Zack Ryder, they were still chanting for him during the main event. If you remember, Zack Ryder had his Z True Long Island story throughout 2011, and it really built up this idea of wanting people to sign a petition for him to get a match against uh, Dolph Ziggler for the US title at Survivor Series, and people signed it, and then they didn't do it. They went with like, Dolph Ziggler and John Morrison, who I think at this point, unfortunately, was pretty cold during his run. And the crowd rejected it heavily. They continued to cheer for Ryder, and they continued to cheer for Ryder throughout the whole night, including the main event. And even after the show, when Rock gets on the mic, he cuts a promo, kind of thanking the crowd for coming. They're still chanting for Zack Ryder. And uh, Ryder even talked about how maybe people were telling him, hey, go on out there with Rock at the end of the show. Go into business for yourself. He didn't do it, but uh, maybe in retrospect, he should have, because he was really on the verge and it really showed the power of the internet here on this show so a lot of fond memories here i don't know if this match is anything to write home about but i think you can consider the big deal there and of course the ending of the match rock laying out cena getting you all set for wrestlemania which is always what i always feel like survivor series should be the kickoff to wrestlemania season and it certainly was here and uh really fun stuff here so at the end of the day that is what number four is on my list now let's get into the top three and we're going to start with Survivor Series 2014, Team Authority versus Team Cena. 
if Team Cena should win, the Authority will be banished forever, no longer in power, and uh, Team Authority here is a fun one. I mean, both teams are fun, but let's, let's get into Team Authority first. It was Rusev, Mark Henry, Seth Rollins, Luke Harper, and Kane. They went up against Team Cena, consisting of John Cena, Dolph Ziggler, Eric Rowan, Ryback, and The Big Show. And the build here was just, it was so well done. Was some of the best build was figuring out who was going to be on each team. Ryback finally accepting uh, his place on Team Cena. It was, it was great. And for me, uh, I thought there was a couple of things here I really loved. First off, Big Show turning immediately and eliminating himself from the match. And, uh, you know, when Team Cena needed him. And, of course, he always turns. So there he is turning again, doing what's best for him. Wanted to make sure he was in a good place with the authority should they take over as the uh, the lead there and uh, continue their reign at, at being in power. So it made sense for him to do that because he's always after himself. He's a selfish dude. Uh, I also love the pieces there when Rowan and Harper go ahead and they have a match. And Harper here, I mean, and Rowan here rather, he's like off the babyface team and actually getting a bit of a push, which is weird. They do a deal where uh, TLC is actually renamed TLCS Tables, ladders, chairs, and stairs because of the Roman, uh, because of the Eric Rowan stairs match that's added to that show. So interesting tidbit there. Um, but of course, this comes down. It's interesting because it comes down. You get rid of Cena. Match is long. One thing you probably you probably have carved ten minutes off this match. The match is very long, but uh, it, it's a fun one. And when eventually Cena's gotten rid of, and when he is, it comes down to Dolph Ziggler going against the final members of the Authority, and it really finally felt like all right. Maybe Dolph Ziggler is about to break through that glass ceiling because we have been waiting for so long. We thought when he cashed in uh, and he won the title in 2013, that was going to be the moment. But we thought maybe this was going to be a big moment for Dolph Ziggler. He outlasts everyone. It comes down to Dolph Ziggler versus Seth Rollins. Obviously, Triple H gets in there. He starts beating the crap out of Dolph Ziggler. And then that's the moment that you never thought you'd see. Lights go out. Crow sound. And here comes Sting. The icon Sting from WCW, who never came to WWE. He was the one holdout. He had this whole long run in TNA because he didn't believe in the WWE product, didn't want to work for WWE, didn't want to work for Vince McMahon. And now here he was coming in and being embraced, really, as being a part of WWE. And uh, I thought it was just such a cool moment. It was uh, incredible. And even though it was the WWE Network, you know, that first year WWE Network, uh, I, I had had so many wrestling parties that that first year, I still had people coming over for the events. I don't think we fully embraced the idea of, like, you can just watch the pay-per-view in your own time yet. So we still tried to watch them live. This is probably the last one we did that way. Because also I started going to a lot of the events pretty quickly after this. Um, but I remember watching this one with a bunch of people and all of us just, like, high five and so excited to see Sting in WWE. And then Dolph Ziggler gets the win. Not only does he get the win, but at the end, so the authority is vanished. They end up, of course, coming back in just a little tiny bit. But they had literally, I think a month later, they're back in power. But they do a deal where uh, Dolph Ziggler, he gets the big win for Team Cena. Cena kind of embraces him at the end, holds his arm up. And that's the last image you see. And he had still didn't get anywhere with Ziggler. Ziggler still was kind of never pushed over that hump as a top guy in WWE. I don't know why. I feel like he had it all. He was somebody the crowd loved for many years until eventually they just got tired of loving him. They just figured, hey... Their to be isn't going to give us what we want, so they kind of gave up on him, which was tough. Uh, but here he is probably his crowning achievement, I'd say. I'd say probably his biggest moment is cashing in on Alberto de Rio the night after WrestleMania 29. But number two is right here, Survivor Series 2014. What a match, though. An incredible moment there for Sting to debut. All right, so we've come to our final two. And, you know, I have been such a War Games hater. My big critique of War Games is that it takes so long to get started. Uh, you start there with two men in the ring and two women in the ring, then you have five-minute interval, then you have three-minute intervals till everyone comes in the ring, then finally the match starts. It's almost just like, well, I don't need to watch this first 25 minutes. Like, they should really, in my opinion, add some eliminations to it. But that being said, I can't hate them too much because they're both going to be the two War Games main events are my top two here. I went back and forth on this a lot. Uh, number two for me is going to be Survivor Series 2022. It was the team of the Bloodline, uh, Roman Reigns, the Usos, Solo Sokoa, and Sami Zayn going up against Kevin Owens, Drew McIntyre, and the Brawling Brutes. I could have given you all night to come up with the final three guys that were on that team, and you never would have came up with Butch and Ridge Holland being in the main event of a WWE pay-per-view, but here we are. 
Uh, they were in this match, and this is such an incredible story from start to finish. I loved this story of Sami Zayn trying to get into the bloodline, trying to get the acceptance from Roman Reigns and from the Usos, and the story is so well done throughout this entire match. It even starts with like Roman kind of keeping his eye on Sami. Like, he doesn't fully trust Sami just yet, and then at the end of the show, you know, Sami does everything he can. He keeps sacrificing himself for Jay Uso. Jay was the last holdout too. You remember those guys are so close now. Jay was the last one to really fully accept Sammy as a part of the bloodline. And so they finally go back and forth. Sammy keeps starting, you know, you have Roman and all these different people, uh, you know, he keeps sacrificing himself for. And probably the end of the match is when Roman, uh, Kevin Owens lays out Roman Reigns with a, with a stunner, goes for the cover and has Roman beat. Reveries one, two, and then Sammy jumps in to hold the ref's hand up to make sure he doesn't count that three count. And... Then from there, uh, he gives he goes low, gives a low blow to Kevin Owens, drops him down so that uh, he allows Jay to go up and hit the Jay splash on uh, Kevin Owens. One, two, three, Bloodline wins. And that's the moment the whole Bloodline finally accepts Sami Zayn. He doesn't go from being the honorary use anymore. He's now accepted into the Bloodline. The, you know, him and Jimmy embrace with the big, you know, whatever they used to do that. I can't even try to do it to myself. What am I doing? Uh, and, you know, Jay gives him a big hug. Roman gives him, all right, you're in. You're in. Let's do this. And I think this moment, if WWE, would they, and I always say they could do this to this day, right? You can see they're doing double tapings during the holidays. These shows don't matter at all here before they go to Netflix. If there's ever a time for WWE to end their season, it'd be on Survivor Series. And I really think if you had ended this show, you can still have your live events. I think those are important night after uh, Christmas in Madison Square Garden is awesome. That being said, I think if they've taken TVs off for a month following Survivor Series, and now you had a month to see where they'd go with this new bloodline now all in one, and then they were the first thing you saw as Raw kicked off the next year, that would be perfect. I mean, that you really should do that. Uh, you know, imagine building that anticipation. I remember this show ending and just being like watching the, pre the press conference after, and Sammy talking about how much it meant to him, and Paul Heyman talking about how Sami Zayn had become kind of he was the guest star but he did so well that they kept bringing him back on the series until eventually he became a big part of the main cast and that's exactly what he equated Sami to um, it's just so well done it, it's such a great match these guys all go out there and kill it and obviously the end here with uh, the ending is just it's it's perfect it's so great and I think that it would have taken not one but two incredible returns in order to top it it's just that's what we got the next year because number one for me war games 2023 you had team cody rhodes consisting of cody rhodes seth freaking rollins main event jay uso Sami Zayn, and the returning randy orton going up against the judgment day consisting obviously of damian priest finn balor jd mcdonough dominic mysterio and for one night only they had brought in the services as well of drew mcintyre and this match was just awesome. Uh, from start to finish, they continued to tease that Orton was coming back. He wasn't there. And then eventually what they set up for was uh, Damian Priest had Seth Rollins laid out. Now comes Rhea Ripley to cash in Money in the Bank. She's about to do it. And then bang, voices in my head come out there. Orton comes out. Away we go. And they did such a great job because, of course, there was this rumor in everyone's mind that if CM Punk was ever going to come back it had to be in Chicago so it had to be at Survivor Series so when you're building up this mystery opponent this mystery partner for uh Cody Rhodes it was like oh who's it going to be is it going to be Orton or is it going to be CM Punk so they actually reveal on Raw that it's supposed to be Orton which was smart because it got CM Punk kind of out of everyone's mind you, you did get a couple Punk chants throughout the night but the crowd absolutely took to Orton they were thrilled to see him you hadn't seen him now in two years and he come back looking yoked and ready to go and just like a million bucks. So that was really cool to see. They come in there. He prevents the Priest from cashing in. All the baby faces hit all the big moves. They stand tall. They get the big win. You get the huge RKO off the top of the cage. There uh, you have JD McDonough thrown off the top. Hits the RKO there. And then, uh, and then Orton gives JD McDonough to Cody as if to say like, Hey man, this is your space now. You, you got this. Cody hits the crossroads, big win, Davey faces embrace, and they teased it for so long that I really thought Punk's not coming back. You know, it had been 10 years, uh, nine years, I guess, at this point, uh, and every single show, this the, this the time Punk's come back. 
this the time Punk's coming back. Every Royal Rumble, this is the time Punk's coming back. You got to a point where it's like, you didn't actually think he's ever going to come back. And post the stuff with AEW, with all the drama and everything that went on with his departure from AEW, you really wondered if WWE needed that all of that drama to come their way. Uh, you know, Boot Business was doing well. It's not like they were struggling. Did they need CM Punk? And it looked like at the end of this night, you weren't going to get CM Punk. It looked like you were going to get Randy Orton, all the baby faces embraced, hands held high, rolling up the credits, and then you got CM Punk. An incredible moment that to this day uh, stands the test of time. I think that it was so well done. And of course he comes out and uh, he's in the, just the regular white shirt. He's all excited and he's got this look on his face. The crowd is just losing their mind. They're going nuts. I mean, one of the most incredible reactions is the idea, hey, it happened in Chicago. And I've heard interviews with Punk where he talks about that, that it had to happen in Chicago. And of course, Punk's come, Punk, uh, of course, I'm so excited, I'm losing my words here. And of course, Punk comes out and he's embraced by the fan, the fan that will live forever. And the fan grabs him and he just goes, Chicago, Chicago, Chicago. And it was like, wow, like I, it looked like Punk was never going to get out of this man's grasp, but it was awesome. CM Punk was back in WWE and uh, it's hard to top that. You know, what an incredible moment. Something you ne I never, I had given up. I never thought you'd see it. And, uh, and yet there it was. So not only did you get Randy Orton coming back, but just moments later, you got CM Punk coming back. And on top of that, incredible match. Maybe I should start stop hating our war games. It's clearly I love it so much as we go through it. Just feel like you can make it a little shorter or add something to make the match mean something before war games itself begins. Uh, but really great stuff here. Can't put it over enough. And that is number one on my countdown. So let me know how you rank the Survivor Series main events from worst to best. I'd love to hear some of your pieces of uh, wisdom, so to speak. And let me know where this year's main event is going to fall if we come back and revisit this in the future. Until next time, everybody, dubs up always. Enjoy Survivor Series. <laughs>